by the Central Deputy Director and also the Chief Librarian Archivist. I was going to say on behalf of our director, Dr. Melendez, welcome, bueno, <laughs> bienvenido a todos, a special evening tonight. Thank, thanks to all of you for coming this evening and to participate in this event. Uh, 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 this is uh, an event that we, we are, uh, in the Omar Entre Islas, is, is, uh, we have uh, 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 organized this panel to, so they, we have the artists to tell us a little bit about what had been their personal experience as panel. So I want to welcome Anis Burgos, who will welcome our artists. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, all. Thank you for sharing the experience um, with the panelists. Um, I just want to say it's a, a great um, pleasure to be here in Central, working with a group of um, staff, incredible staff. Um, I, I was trying to basically say or connect what should I say in this panel, and I just um, connect some dots. And basically, I think um, this show is very important because sometimes we um, Puerto Ricans don't take um, um, or oh, don't know the information that um, Lorenzo Mar was living in New York. So um, those kind of information is very important for us living in New York and for many artists. Uh, and, and from this um, exhibition, to this panel is, is connected because um, it's Omar, um, Omar de aquí y de allá, basically from the court. Um, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank the panelists that's going to be here um, talking about the experience that they will have, or they had with Lorenzo Mar. Um, I think that's very important because sometimes you just talk about the artists, and the artists is up there. But the his um, the experience for other artists is very important. So I will um, I'll thank you to be here and share with us this experience. I want to say thanks to Nelson Otero, um, Lisa Cofino, and Rodríe Calero. Oh, yeah. we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome all. Uh, as you already know, my name is Nestor Otero. I'm an artist and graphic designer, illustrator. Uh, Inicia Tufin is also an artist muralist. And Rodriguez Calero, also a very talented artist. Uh, we're all very talented, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're all dedicated to our community, and we love our community. And uh, we're here to reinforce the presence of an extraordinary figure in our community, Lorenzo Mal. The period from 1920 to 1950 was transformative in Omar's personal artistic life. New York and neighbors in which he lived, Washington Heights, Sheepshed Bay, and Corona, exposed him to social, economic, and cultural differences between the boroughs. His job as a messenger allowed him to explore Manhattan streets and alley. He often mentioned how amazed he was at the skyscrapers, inspiring him to create drawings of such urban architectural wonders. He enjoyed the city's monuments, which ex expanded his knowledge about art. He relished in simply watching the faces of walking, of people walking the streets or riding the subways, and captured some of the fleeting moments in the pages of his many sketchbooks. Exploring the city also gave him the opportunity to pick out artists working in public spaces. This is how Omal met Reginald Marsh and learned the fresco technique. Marsh was creating at the old custom house uh, during these years. Reginald Marsh was a social realist. Omal also found time to pra practice and become a champion gymnast at the YMCA, as well as cultivate his passion for film and music. I'm going to run through some photographs here. Mm -hmm. The kind of, mm. this I think would be in the Art Students League, know, right? Yeah. The Art Students League. There's a group of his yeah, colleagues. With Rufino Tamayo. Yeah, Tamayo. And obviously yeah. we can already yeah. recognize him up. Yeah. With his tilted yeah. head in the back. He's in the middle. <laughs> oh, Tamayo's at the end and okay. uh, Omar is at the middle. Top right, yeah. the other What was that, Roca? Yeah. The other That's Omar. Tamayo. That's Rufino Tamayo. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's Aman. And these are some of the other students. This is, this is when he got married to Dorothy. Oh. 
And I guess the other people were friends, and they also they got married at the same time, so they were sort of like being witnesses to each other. So Omar is the guy who lied. I think he's yeah, his brother. The yeah. one, and the, the wife is Dorothy. That looks like the Bronx. Es yeah, americana. Yeah. Sí, yeah. es americana. Eh. She was a neck model for uh, in Cartier. In Cartier, yeah. There we go. <laughs> this guy was even a, a jockey, you jewelry, know. Lorenzo Ma was incredible. This guy was a man for all seasons. And he was highly skilled in all the areas. Of, huh? Yeah, in Cardia, for Cardia, yeah. That's where he met her. He was a gymnast, a swimmer. You'll see some of the photos. And also, uh, uh, her parents lived around Germantown. 86 year old. Yeah, down there. That's Germantown. In, in New York or in New York? Okay. Not in Brooklyn. And no. this is with one of his daughters, or is that some other? You know, I don't know. This might be no, Susan. No, he's a baby. There. Has to be Susan. This is a baby. This is Susan. What? That's yeah, Susan little. is the older one. Susan Omar. That's and not, then that's not Omar, is it? Yeah, that's Omar. That's Omar. Yeah. Omar. But he yes, looks like he's young. There, it could be somebody else. This is Omar. It could be. Maybe See, that's I think his child. I think it's, it's just another person's child. I don't think that's his. No, because Susan, well, Susan was He's too young there, yeah. right. He's too young to be. Okay, so that photo's out of sequence. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. No, but anyway, that's Laura, Lorenzo Mar on bike. <laughs> Susan was born in Puerto Rico, and Laura también. Laura is the youngest. Yeah, because he looks younger than here. You see. Yeah. But he looked young anyway. You know, but even when yeah, he, he always. Yeah, because, because he, he was a gymnast, and he always kept was Kept in shape, doing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look at this. Yeah, that's wow. New York. That's New York. That's New York. Where is it? These I'm going to go through, not too fast, but uh, just to give you an idea. This is him in the middle. <laughs> that's incredible, but this one's even more so. Look at this. Look at that. Which count the balance. <laughs> incredible. Who's who? wow. The one on the top over on here. The top that's is the one. And then here, I think this is a swimming team, right? And that would be him at the bottom and the right. Right, is yeah. That him? Yeah. And again, in top form here. Okay. Do we have any knowledge of who the photographer was? Well, they had to be different photographers, but I don't. Different, but I don't think it was anyone well known or anything, just someone there taking pictures. Yeah. But I mean, some of these photos are very well taken, That's the one from the skyscraper. I'm not saying that so they're not good. No, no, I'm saying that, that, uh, an artist friend. We have to speak to Susana or other, somebody, I don't know. Oh, who, where'd you get the pictures from? The family. Susana. Some of them came from the University of Puerto Rico, the, the, the Museo de Arte Victoria, the University of Puerto Rico. No, but Flavio sent a lot of them, file. So this is military. Well, he was, he, you know, Omar yeah. also took a lot of pictures. He had a roller flex. Those big mm -hmm. ones that had the, he always yeah, was taking lines, pictures. Because yeah. I have Large some, form. I had, yeah, I have him, somebody taking a picture of him. I got to find it, where That's he's holding the roller flex. Okay, this is some of, in the army. This is in the army. Isn't that Philippines? Mm -hmm. And that's him again. My turn to do it. Which one is he? The second, the second one from the, the right. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> it's my turn to read here. Okay, no, that's what his dad. That's what his father. Okay. Are these okay, photos all in the essential collection? No, some of them were sent by Flavio Marichal from El Museo de Arte Historia y Antropología de la Universidad yeah, de Puerto Rico. This, and this then, is a family collection, but you know, uh, we are in the scan. process of and then I, I talking gave, to them if they allow us to, to keep copies yeah. in the archives. Okay. Well, I mean, digitalize them and get them out there, man. Huh? You know. Well, I have <laughs> some photos. Like I have, like I have some photos which I have uh, in my archive over here. So I gave them to El Centro. Yeah. So, you know, they can be used. A lot of these photos, unfortunately, when they send them from the university, they, they were scanned and they put this horrible filter in them that mm -hmm. compromised a lot the quality of the photographs. So, not so much these, but there's a couple that, that the filters really... 
Let me see if I... These I try to rescue, but they were... That's so when I come across with them, but... Sometimes if, if you don't know how to retouch photos, better to just leave them alone. <laughs> yeah, because it's... Uh, like me? I'm sorry, per personal unwarranted <laughs> advertisement. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, when uh, Roca's going to start right. talking. <coughs> art, however, was Omar's first passion, and he took art classes in major academic institutions in the city every chance he could. In the Art Students League, he became a pupil of the Canadian American artist George Bridgman in 1931. Some years later, between 1939 and 42, he took art courses at night school at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Upon his return to civilian life, he enrolled in the art school of the Brooklyn, I'm sorry, in the art school of the Brooklyn Museum, where he studied under the great Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo. Omar's working years at the House of Cartier from 1937 to 1942 and 1946 to 1950 provided him with personal, financial, and artistic career development. His early years as a design apprentice gave him the time to copy and reproduce the works of famous art masters from around the world, which he did at the Metropolitan Museum and others. Eventually, he used these drawings to design jewelry and to, perf to perfect his skills. When he returned to Cartier in 1946, he took over more responsibilities as the assistant of the head designer. He also learned engraving and many other art techniques and met skillful and talented artisans and artists that encouraged him to pursue his artistic interests and to work collectively with his colleagues. Omar in interrupted his art studies to volunteer in the U.S. Army during World War II. He saw combat in Europe and was awarded the Purple Heart Award and was awarded the Purple Heart, awarded to those wounded while serving in action. One year later, he enlisted again and was stationed in New Guinea and the Philippines for the remainder of the war. His drawings created during this period were admired by fellow soldiers and officers and published in military and civil publications such as Yank, Infantry Journal, Bell, Syndicate, and El Mundo. Okay. Uh, and a lot of these drawings, if you go to Princeton, are, are there because he donated a lot of his drawings of, uh, his, of his, during the wartime and his jewelry designs so. and posters. Right. Okay, yeah. We're going to have uh, these photographs of photographs that Nisa submitted. So. Okay, so this is in Vivetco, okay, and they were, this, this used to be a marketplace that they turn into the division of education. And what happened in these rooms, like this is one of the rooms where you have some of the artists. You could see Eduardo Vera over there, Sasso, and on the corner over there is Antonio Maldonado. Mm -hmm. And some of these sculptures that you see there, some of them that are dogs or stuff like that, were done by Eduardo Vera. So actually, and you see the plenas in the back over there. You see Tufinos and, and Omar's plena. And Omar was the one head of the graphics department in Diveco when, after Irene left, because when it first opened, it was Irene, and then Irene left, and then Omar took it over. And then when Omar went to run the one at the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, my father was the head of the graphics department. And then after that, Irene, Irene, Irene Delano. Delano, Irene Delano, and Jack Delano. I'm sorry about this. I, that, it's so familiar for me <laughs> that I think that they're my family, and I forget to say their last name. <coughs> so, uh, so they have many rooms, and since they, you know, the the writers had their own room, and in the in the in, in those rooms there was Pedro Juan Soto, Rene Malque, Emilio Diaz Barcarcel. Uh, those those were the main writers and they had their own section. And then there was a section that later we're going to show you here, if you pass Next. the photo. Okay, if you don't, for those that don't, don't, don't know, let me real quick. 
besides the posters and the films and everything, there were these little booklets that were produced. Right. There right. were educational booklets, and the writers that she mentioned were the ones that would write the text, and then the artists would illustrate them. Okay, I forgot to say something. Yeah. The way the division worked was uh, they had a department that dealt with uh, the social problems of the community, and that was run by Fred Whale. He was an urban affairs, actually, an urban planning that had gone to Columbia University and he was hired by Munoz Marin to head that department. And, what, uh, and also he was connected to some other urban planning and air affairs people who were actually in Hunter College, like Hans Spiegel. And I'll talk to you more about Hans Spiegel later on, who I, I don't know if he's still around, but he's here in Hunter in the urban. Right. You want but, to make a yeah, my, my question was, you mentioned two things there, which is interesting because I always thought uh, uh, the whole thing as one, like the División de Educación de la Comunidad, but there was two, two actually two talleres, right? One with, with the Institute of Culture. Right. That came later. Right. You have to that understand later, yeah. that. That came later, or? Yeah, that right. Came later. You have to understand the periods um, uh, in Puerto Rico where, you know, you got the 40s and there's things happening, but nothing is happening, mm -hmm. okay? And then what happens is that uh, when Omar and Tufino and Torres Martino get to Puerto Rico after the war, okay, somehow they find each other. And when they find each other that they're artists, they decide, well, we gotta do something. So they create first El Centro de Arte Puerto Riqueño, okay? And uh, that was Omar's actually, he was his, it was his idea. Okay, and they got a space in Calle Cristo where they had a gallery and they taught art and everybody was part of that. Carlos Raquel, Félix Rodríguez ba eh, Rodríguez Baez, Carlos Raquel, este, Félix Rod eh, there was a lot of a lot of other people. I can't remember exactly their names now. So when that happens, that is on Calle Cristo and they're doing that, at the same time Muñoz Marín is the governor of Puerto Rico and he's around in La Fortaleza. Already Munoz Marin started discussing with Irene and Jack Delano about doing something for Puerto Rico and the poverty and all the problems that they were having of health and situation within the island. Mm -hmm. So they needed, they needed to do something. So Irene and Jack were talking to him. They lived near each other. Munoz Marin had a house in Trujillo Alto, but he was also at the Fortaleza, and the, the uh, Delanos lived near him. So. <coughs> Uh, Jack started talking about the WPA and what the U government had done here with the WPA. So they created, started creating La División, but then at the same time, Muñoz Marín used to walk over to El Centro to talk to the artists, to talk to René Marquez. René Marquez was part of the, El Centro, Emilio Díaz Valcárcel, and all of that. And from there, that's where they get the idea to unite the writers and the visual people together to work with the social workers to create pamphlets and seal screens and movies to educate the people. So that idea comes from that, and then Munoz Marin puts the money towards uh, La División. That was La División. And that's La División. <coughs> and La División was in the- 1949. Right, right. So then that means that the División is where they used to be el mercado. Era, y todavía se llama in old San Juan, the streets. El Museo San Juan was the Museum of San Juan. A, y ahora es el Museo de San Juan. Eso era Divetco. So and it was covered. There, if you go there, that was all covered. Now so it's open, but it was covered. It was covered, And right. all the film production would take place right. there. They would do the sets and everything there. Exactly. And, and I'll show you pictures. Uh, so in that, what happened was they had uh, social workers that Fred had had to this his deposition that they hired and there was a department to go into the countryside and talk to the people and organize them and do cooperatives and all of that and find out in each town or pueblos what was it that they needed and then they will bring in the writers and the writers will, will go there and then they will start writing stories and then they will bring the visual artists Tufino will go there that's when Tufino discovered uh, about and juntas, and about coffee making, and all of that, and that's where he comes out with the series Del Café. Because these artists, actually, they knew about Puerto Rico, but they didn't know what was in the mountains, because it was very hard mm. to go up there. 
you know, no to the up high up in the city. So these social workers, they used to go in jeeps. Fred Well used to go in jeeps and all of that. Then they bring Amilcar in, who was the one in charge of movie. You know, his son worked right. here and all his So Amilcar used yeah. to be in charge. OK, so we'll take the scripts and we'll try to do some movies. And then they have sound. So in this big place that you said, that was like uh, el, el, el Mercado Ese. La Plaza you, Mercado, the, you know, sí. when you go to see El Museo de San Juan, you're going to see that. One department was the social workers. One department was the movie. And they had a, a station for editing. So when I was a kid, I used to run over there and see how they edit <laughs> all of that. And then they had another department for printing to do the, the booklets. Right, right. They had dark rooms. They had all kinds of equipment. And then they had where they used to do the silk screens, you know, la serigrafia and all of that. And then each artist had an area where they would work. And in the beginning, they used to work like from 9 to 5 and stuff like that. But then they changed it because artists don't work. It was more about let's get the job done, the production. Uh, rather than you being here from night to side and your your head, you cannot produce anything. And then another time, what they did was like they had houses like uh, in Manatee or somewhere, and then you could go over there with your family and spend the whole day or spend the weekend, or in San Justo or Barranquitas and stuff yeah. like that, so that people could get more involved yeah. with the. Uh, with the culture and with the people and do drawings and take photographs and all of that. Like I know Jack used to take a lot of right. photos and stuff well, like that. What was interesting was also during so, that time some of the most um, talented and brilliant people in Puerto Rico were part of the VECO. It's not just writers. They and were then playwrights, they were, filmmakers. But artists. they were all, one thing that they were all very strong with and Muñoz Marin knew, uh, understood that it was that they were pro independence. So at one point when they came out, one of the booklets, uh, booklets which is about the, uh, who, what is a dictator. This is to teach the people in Puerto Rico <laughs> about voting. What is a dictatorship? To teach the people in Puerto Rico who is a dictatorship, how the dictatorship come about. And Jose Melendez Contreras did the graphics, and Tufino did the graphics. And th there were all kinds of things about advertising, mod modesta, to say there's, there's all kinds of things. So, uh, and a lot of time, whenever they needed children, uh, Amilcar would say, oh, Nixa, come on, let's go for the movies. We need children for the movies. So I wanted to carry the camera. I wanted to always do something, you know? So that's how come I was always involved with them and running all over the place over there. And what's interesting about this and about Omar is that Omar was actually a very family man. He was very devoted to Dorothy which is very different from my side with my father. He's very devoted to his wife, but he had devoted to many others, you know what I mean? So I have many stepmothers. And the thing is that El Barceda, which was around the corner, that's where they used to go sometimes to walk around and go over there and have a beer, or you get together with some other of the writers because they couldn't write inside the office. So used to go there, used to buy you juice. When I was a kid, they used to buy me juice and stuff like that. They had a bellonera, so René, when he was writing Los Soles Cotrunco, lo que sea, he would go there and play la bellonera and drink <laughs> and just write. Imagination. Exactly, he used to do more. So a lot of work was also done in El Barceda, which Omar never did that. He was always in his studio, or, and after that, that Divetco, he moved over to, to El Instituto because then the Instituto of Puerto Rico uh, comes into effect in 1956. That that's when Don Ricardo starts uh, running it, that they put it in place. And that's by where the old casino used to be. When you go down old San Juan, that big building there, that's where it used to be. And that was it. They had a, yeah, and the artists, and like, like, so Omar was in charge of the, graphic department, and then after that, I don't know what happened. My father left Divetco and went to work with Omar. Like, OK, Tefo, come over. We need you over here, you know what I mean? So he went to work for an instituto. And over there, that's when they started the idea because they had of doing a school, because they had Compostela there. The uh, Batista, who was a sculptor, also was sculpting. there. Um, there was uh, another painter. So, but Oliver, huh? Oliver, Marín, 
a Gusto Marín. A, Rios, yes, so, yeah, but then yeah, later on they started adding other people. Oliver, sí. Oliver, the, the, he Oliver. was a, you know, he did also, I don't know if you've seen his Cubist paintings. paintings Cubist yeah. painting with light and reds yeah. and stuff like that. So uh, that's when they, they started doing all of that. And at time was interested that the same thing at the, that happened at Divetco. In Divetco, uh, Manuel Hernández Acevedo, which, uh, this, this is him printing a lithograph. Uh, so we were going places, now we're doing lithographs. Yeah, lithographia. <laughs> lithographs are engraving on stones. You etch it into the stones as yeah. opposed to, to transferring yeah. it through screens as in silk screen. Well, this is in Diveco. This is that big room that I talked to you where they did film. And, and they uh, will also, like when they did La Plena, if you see the mural of La Plena that my dad did, that's room, that's where he, he did it. The panels were put there and then the andamios. They just restored it recently. Yeah, yes. well, it's been restored. Now it's restored and it's in the Museo de Puerto Rico. Yes, in Museo de Puerto Rico. But uh, this room was made, and what happened here is that Amir Cartirado won, the Divetco won uh, El Premio en Venecia de, de cine, que es sobre el puente, about the bridge, because they went to the town, the so, the, los sociólogos le preguntaron to the town, you know, I don't, I don't know what pueblo it was. Uh, what is it that you need? We need a bridge. We gotta make a bridge. So they make a whole movie of how they get the people together, they make the bridge and all of that. And the photography and everything in that movie is so fantastic that they take it to Europe and the Germans are like, what the hell is this? This is so fantastic. These people are way out, you know what I mean? And all of that, and in Venice they win the, the, the el premio. So here you have all of them. They decided to make that paper mural in the back with Amilcar, que se ganó el premio en Venecia. And they made a paper mache guy, you know. So all these guys were like, you know, like kids, you know, a bunch, you know, let's do paper mache, let's do this, let's do film. And I wish I was a kid with my other friends and got a salary just for doing that, you know what I mean? So Muñoz, Muñoz Marin, even though they fought with Maureen and they had their kind of arguments and stuff like that, you know, there was a lot of respect. But also there was a lot of, even with René, because René was like, you know, we were sort of like socialists and all of that. They were bien socialistas, tú sabes. Pero, they respected them. Muñoz Marín also seemed to think of himself as an artist also. Well, he was a poet because of Anali, Ana, what, uh, Luna, ¿cómo se llamaba la esposa de Mona Lee? Mona Lee. And he had a son, este, Muñoz, Muñoz Lee, who later on did the, the, the uh, small newspapers for America and called the Island Times. So, in, in Muñoz, Muñozito, yo digo Muñozito because <laughs> he used to come to my house all the time, you know, and hang out with my father. He, he and he looked very much like Muñoz Marín. He was bien guapísimo con mustache y todo eso. <laughs> eh, you know, uh, he has his conflict too because his father was very powerful and all of that. So there was a lot of things going on. He did this newspaper called the Island Times, and a lot of them they wrote for it and stuff like that. Then later. He, ha he married somebody, he had children, like three children or something like that, which I know also, Gloriela right. and all of that. But then uh, he fell in love with Ana Garcia, who was <laughs> the <laughs> ball prima ballerina who had El Ballet de San Juan. Sister to Hilda Navarro, who last night they celebrated here at the University of Puerto Rico. So you see there's a lot of connections here between people in the arts and doing theater because then Omar got involved in doing uh, the scenery for set Juan design, Bobo, yeah. set design. He was very big doing in, in the set design and René also. René for Sol Estrunco and all that, Omar used to do a lot of the sets, you know. Este, el otro era el papá de, 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 de Poli Marichal. During that period too, uh, which is sort of like a renaissance, that's, when they, that, that's him in the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. Okay, and this is a, a, a photo that Marvin Schwartz took. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's getting older. He has a lot of other photographs that we're right. trying to see if I could get them to a centro. And okay. the way he took this picture is because they used to work on seal screen like one week, two weeks, and then on Fridays, people always knew they could go over there because they could grab their posters every Friday. And then they could talk to them and all of that. That's why you see them there. People are coming over to pick up their posters. 
Okay. Entonces, pues, tienes que terminar de leerlo. Okay, so let me read. Let me talk a me. Throughout his life, Omar positioned himself to the left of the political spectrum and was known for his unwavering support of Puerto Rico's independence movement. During the Spanish Civil War, he wanted to join the brigade supporting the Republican side, but his father dissuaded him. Omar was not a communist, but an admired and befriended many of them, such as Jesus Colón. He denounced McCarthyism for destroying people's lives. He participated in political causes and enjoyed challenging figures of authority, including the governor of Puerto <coughs> Rico. Because of this, he found himself in trouble with the political and social establishment. As a result, he faced rejection and exclusion from major art and cultural events. However, Omar never compromised his principles. <coughs> Some of the artwork on display in our binding ties from Puerto Rico to New York City provides examples of resolute support for these causes. Once in Puerto Rico in 1950, Omar made use of the skills and experience he acquired while living and working in New York City. He truly earned the respect of fellow artists and became a leader in the island art scene as well as a national treasure. His seminal prints works, created while serving as the director of the graphic studio for the Division of Community Education and the Institute of Cultura Puerto Ricana, as well as his private studio, mm -hmm. elevated Puerto Rican art production and earned him worldwide accolades. Today, his art is displayed in public and private collections throughout Puerto Rico the United States, Latin America, and Europe. We are proud to have received donation of his work throughout the years and are pleased that his work will remain with Centro for future generations <coughs> to appreciate. Omar epitomized the best of Puerto Rican art at the same time throughout his life and wherever he traveled. New York remained a place for which he felt emotionally and intrinsically tied. Okay, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a pre individual presentation of our work and kind of discuss how we feel that this whole tradition of, uh, of uh, the 50s influenced our work, how they touched this, and how they became part of our vocabulary. And of course, there's us and a lot of other artists here, like Uli Cancel and Marco Dima that are here that I'm, I'm sure the impact was direct and profound. Okay, let me see here. There were some other photos. Oh, let me just, uh, there's a couple of more photos here I'd like to show before we, uh, Uh, these are kind of some photos that I added uh, that I think this is him with uh, Tonio Maltorrell which is probably one of his most transcendental students along with Roca <laughs> that, uh, and someone else who's never really mentioned is uh, um, Luis Abram who really ah, Luis Abram who was responsible for doing a lot of his silk screens was and, a, and uh, engraving I mean he yeah, he really. I think he was like the other Omar. Right. Really, he, yeah, he thought everybody. He worked with him till the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also in the case of uh, Antonio Martorell, uh, Antonio Martorell actually studied. Um, how would I say to be an ambassador? That's what he's oh, for the diplomacy. Diploma. He, diplomacy. Diplomacy. <laughs> so when he finished school, because his father wanted him to go to school, when he got out, he said, "No, I want to be an artist." So actually, the training that Maltorel got, he got it from Omar Antufino at the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, mm. uh, and he will attest to that. You know that mm. most of the things that he knows and that he knows how to do to design and. Whatever he learned it over there oh, from, from 
to Fino and Omar. I'm photo. sorry, there's some three photos here that it doesn't want to recognize. I'm sorry, but really so we'll go on to. Uh, uh oh. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start with me and uh, okay, what, what? and it's not identifying some of my images either. <coughs> it's actually not identifying any of my work. It's identifying the graphic design. So I don't think I can share the work with you. Are you on the right channel? It says, unless, hold on. Is he on the right channel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, folder. Yeah. Folder. Okay, uh, let me deal with the graphic work. I, Inevitably, through studying with Luis Herman Cajigas, when I got to New York, I returned to New York. I went to, like I mentioned earlier, I went to, to Puerto Rico when I was 12. I returned to New York when I was 17. And when I returned, I wanted a job in the arts, but I didn't know the difference between fine and applied arts. Applied arts. So I thought art was art. So I went to a government agency called JOIN that got jobs for people, you know. And I told them that I wanted a job and I was an artist, so they got me a job in an advertising agency uh, we did movies. Uh, it was advertising movies for 20th Century, Seven Arts, and I met Otto Preminger, I met all these people in film. So it was a wonderful experience, but, and I walked in, I saw drawing boards, and I saw people with magic markers and everything. I said, I can live with this, you know. And obviously it took me a year or so to realize that this isn't really what I want to do. But by then I already had got, gotten hooked in graphic design. I saw the the idea of design, and then inevitably, I, I, uh, I've lived having dual careers as a graphic design illustrator and as a fine artist, quote unquote. And uh, one has influenced the other. And uh, what I did was, as a graphic designer, I always felt, when, once I pulled away from the advertising, that I wanted to dedicate myself, the skills that I had to the community and actually I had met Luis Cancel and Pratt Institute and uh, we got together and we started this organization called Light Source to provide service to minority organizations. What we decided was we have all these skills, we're doing all these things and our organizations, every time they have an activity, they put out an eight and a half by 11 flyer, handmade, photocopy, no catalog, Maybe no your nothing. Breath. I mean, it was sad, you know. So we started doing these multimedia things and, and, and catalogs and stuff like that. And uh, Luis actually is responsible for bringing me to El Barrio. I was a Brooklyn boy. I had just moved into the Lower East Side. I had my first loft in the Lance in Clinton. And he pulled me to El Barrio, and that's when I met Jorge, and I met Marcos Dimas, and Dr. Tayo Boricua, and, and I got connected to that community. And inevitably, what I did was I pulled completely out of advertising. By then, I, had, I went to the Army, I got out, and I decided that I didn't like advertising, so I got into graphic design doing publications and books, and then I took all those skills and dedicated it to our community. Our purpose was that we needed to document ourselves. You know, we had a needed serious documentations. My first encounter with that need was Marta Moreno Vega, who contracted me to start various publications, the newspaper of the Association of Hispanic Arts, Caribe Magazine. Then she contracted me to do catalogs. Unfortunately, at that point, there was that war in El Musel Barrio, and uh, there was a transitional period where there was no direct, and then Jack Agueros came in, and he felt that it was necessary to continue this tradition of doing catalogs. So from Jack Agueros on, it's not that they didn't do catalogs before, because there is this wonderful catalog by, uh, of a group showing in Musel Barrio that Carlos Osorio silk screened the, po the cover, and then they offset the interior. So there were attempts to formalize the documentation of our exhibitions and our cultural activity, but it wasn't formalized. So Jack Aguero was very instrumental and Marta Vega in doing that. So we started doing catalogs, and then one day, Rina Ben Mayor, Ana Hualbe, and uh, Blanca Vaque show up at the museo that they want me to 
work. I don't remember if it was first with the Boletín del Centro, the ex I think it was Boletín del Centro. So I became the first, the founding designer of the Boletín as it's known today. Prior to that, there was a Boletín, but it was like mimeograph photocopied and we turned it into a book. And we used to do a paste up the old way, pasting it down at the beginning, you know, it was like the old Macs, you know, the Macintosh we used to call them. And as a result of that, they contracted me to do two exhibitions. One of them was with Bill Bowles, who was the graphic designer of Musel Barrio, that we did on Jesus Colon, Voices of the Migration. And then we did another exhibition, and then Rina, Blanca, and, and uh, uh, Anna wanted to have a woman do something, so they invited Candy Alvarez. Candy Alvarez is another Puerto Rican artist who has been brought pretty much in an African-American environment, so she has kind of this dual cultural perspective, you know. And she married Dawood Bay, who's a very well-known African-American photographer. And uh, <coughs> she invited me to help her because she had never done anything like this. So I ended up collaborating with her in the second show, which was, uh, and these both were itinerants. They were exhibitions that were collapsed. They would slip in these boxes and they would travel. They went to Miami, they went upstate. They, you know, we took them to City Hall. And the second was, was uh, Nosotros trabajamos en la cultura, Puerto Rican women in the garment industry. <clears throat> and there were these modules that we were kind of put together. Now when you into scale elements and you make them self-standing. So we did this kind of reflection on the Puerto Rican women who worked in the garment industry. Their personal lives, their family lives, they're working in factories. And we did this exhibition. I don't know where they are right now, but <clears throat> it was part also of the oral history project that I, Amilcar Tirado's uh, son worked Part, it was part of that oral history project where people, they would go out to the Brooklyn Pioneers in New York, which was when Marin Tiger first came in, and they would document their voices and then transmit them through the radio. So there was, it was this thing of not about doing these intensive uh, academic studies and shelving them, but putting them out there so people could benefit from them and feel them and, and live them. <clears throat> so I got stuck in that, and then I started picking up my career as a fine artist. And as a result of being with Tayel and Jorge, that's where kind of my career jump started. I went to the School of Visual Arts again and everything kind of took place from there. Uh, this is a, from uh, an exhibition that we did, uh, a group of our exhibitions, Teo Freite, Carimal, who I, I was associated for some years, and Salto, Annex, and my studio, design studio. And these were like these giant photo murals. I don't know, they were like six by 10, 15 feet, they were giant photo murals. They illustrated <coughs> aspects of Clemente, the baseball player's life. It was a big inch exhibition in El Museo de Arte Puerto Rico. And it was a, a, a recall of uh, Clemente's Santulce when he was raised. He was born in Santulce, so it was kind of a way of capturing <laughs> that, what it was like in that time. Unfortunately, it's, it's, I, I can't get any larger, but. This is Oliver Shaw. This again is uh, my obsession with typography starts with the Diveco, with seeing their posters, living with them. Or my uh, Cajigas would take me to San Juan, everybody would give me their posters, and I would look at them forever. I carried them for years, and they would fall apart, and I would tape them together. I was 12 years old, eventually they just disintegrated into my memory. But, <laughs> but I still remember studying them and looking at them, and they influenced my, my uh, my design, and also I, I worked with this, I uh, was the art director for Scarlet Letters, which was one of the pioneer digital type houses in the village, one of the first houses to use digital type. And we did stuff for her Blue Valley at the uh, Pushpin Studio, some of the best designers, uh, Chemoyov, you know, some of the best designers in New York, we did their typographies. They'd be very, very acutely perceptive to the use of typography and the power that it had. And it was a marriage between scholar letters and, and uh, the Diveco tradition. <clears throat> Oliver Shaw is an interesting figure. 19th century, he did the first, uh, one of the first bilingual publications in the Caribbean. And it's amazing because during the 18th, early 19th century, these people were traveling all over the Caribbean when there were no planes, it was in boats, and they knew each other. They did publication, they were to Santo Domingo. They were to Latin America, Colombia, and there was no obstacle. Now, you know, you think about it, and it's, it's like difficult to move around and connect, but th this guy was a real pioneer. He was an illustrator, and he changed his name because he thought it would be more readily accepted as Oliver Shaw. And they did a wonderful exhibition of his work. This I'm honored to follow in the tradition of uh, 
Lorenzo Mal, who did some of the first poses for Festival Casas in my studio, has done them for the last seven, eight years. And this is when they inaugurated La Sala Sinfonica, and the cover, it was a poster and the cover of the program uh, celebrating the, the inauguration of the facilities. Uh, Oliver Shaw's actual name. I'm trying to remember as I speak to you. Uh, Oliver Shaw, I don't know, but if you get off, I don't remember, but I, I should. This is another cover for Festival Casas, and this was like the four elements. We, were, we would always try to focus on something. In this case, we're trying to, we divided the concerts into concerts that responded to the four elements. And I hope the other artists don't have as much problems as I have in showing my images. Okay, this is a uh, Afro Latina. This was El Musal Tecawa. This is the, the cover to a, a uh, an exhibition where artists who who touch the theme of uh, African in in the Caribbean. Uh, there was a collective of artists influenced by African African presence in the Caribbean, I should say. What year was that? This was a couple of years ago, uh, 2013, 12, something like that. It's not too long ago. What are your shows? On I think Malta Vega has something to do with the show. Either she wrote for it or? Some, well, your show was Oliveras, last name, but I can't remember the first name. From the 20s, he actually came, came to study here at New York. In the right, right. 1920s, the artist thing. Okay. Oh, okay. There's another cover that I did for the 2012. It, they wouldn't ever really become posters. I showed. What do they and celebrate at the Festival de Casas? It's coming up. Okay, this is another exhibition. We did this in the Sala Carrion del Banco Popular. This is the cover to the catalog. And it was 100 years of Puerto Rican music, and we touched everything. It was like timelines going around. I didn't bring photographs of the installation, everything. But again, you know, my preoccupation with type and the use of type. And it was everything from Nueva Canción, jazz, este, uh, Latin jazz, okay. musica clásica, típica, to say you name it. It was like a whole, it was these panels, four by eight panels that went around the hall and kind of a timeline that depicted the evolution of all these music forms, when they evolved with the music, musicians, the protagonists of the different musical tendencies. You can see that Eddie Palmieri, Roy Brown, the Tite Cure Alonso, to say, uh, Mark Anthony, Daniel Santos. Daniel Santos, Mark Anthony, and it wraps around, and then it has a flap that comes out. So there's a lot of other. What year was that? That was a long time ago. <laughs> that yeah. was. Uh, years ago? Nena, cuando fue eso? <laughs> Annex. <laughs> No, pero eso fue antes de mudarnos, mudarnos, mudándonos a Santurce. 2000, como 2000 por ahí. It's a long time. Okay, listen, uh, I'm gonna, I'm sorry you can't look at my work. I'll save some other occasion. Let me give uh, another the artist an opportunity to show their work. Oh, there we go. Maybe it's when you put all contents as opposed to photographs, but anyway. Uh, okay, let's... Roca, by the way, has a wonderful show on Adam Museo Valley that you cannot miss yeah. under any circumstances. Okay. And they just use the arrow to push forward, and you have your slide. Oh, you don't have the. You just have to go along and improvise. Thank you. The arrow, you said the arrow. The arrow, yeah. No, to the right, this one, right here. Right here. Well, um, I'm this is a technique which I sort of uh, <laughs> developed, and I and. And I think it really has a lot to do with uh, Omar um, having observed him and watched him and being friends with him uh, when I was in Puerto Rico. I met Omar. Oh, I, I became ill, so I had to go to Puerto Rico, and I was 
and I didn't have the language. I didn't really speak Spanish. I could always understand English. I was born in PR, but raised here in Brooklyn, also another Brooklyn. Uh, and um, so when I went back to Puerto Rico, the thing that I took was art, because the, the language <laughs> wasn't uh, an issue. And um, I was brought to the Instituto de Cultura uh, via my uh, grandfather, who was also uh, very good friends with Omar and all the artists, because he was the uh, founder and director of the Coro de, de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, Augusto Rodriguez. So he, he brought me there and he introduced me to the Instituto when it was right in front of the uh, Parque de, de Muñoz Marin, uh -huh. uh, which was nice. And this is where now they have their archives. So, but they had the talleres there at the time. So um, at that time, uh, Lorenzo wasn't um, my instructor, but because the Tayed was there, and Jose Rosa was there, he, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, I can't remember. Well, they, and, and Luis Abran wasn't there at the time. But uh, he w would have his Tayed there, and so what do you do? You just sort of walk in and out of the uh, workshops, and you stand there, and you ask all these questions, <laughs> and you just look. And uh, Omar was very engaging, and because he was friends with uh, Augusto, um, you know, he he was uh, more than generous. Though he was generous with everyone, and so he permitted me to stay and hang out. And also, I uh, would hang out where the restorations were being done mm -hmm. for all the Santos. So probably <coughs> that had a lot of influence on me, watching them uh, restore all the santos and seeing them, how they applied the gold leaf, and then Omar's uh, using all these transparencies and colors, um, and also s the use of solid color. Um, so I, as mentioned, um, what happened, I, I, I went to Puerto Rico, uh, because of my health, and at the time I, I had to leave uh, Puerto Rico because of my health, because, uh, well, I had improved, but also the, I, I, I couldn't um, continue working with the chemicals. So um, I was returning to New York, and someone had sent me uh, an article about the art student's sleep. So I said, oh, let me check this place out. And that's how I wound up going to the Art Students League. And I, I just uh, was taking drawings with um, Marshall Glacier, who was uh, a, a very well uh, draftsman, and, and some other well-known artists at the time. And uh, I was fortunate. So between Puerto Rico meeting a lot of icons, uh, as you say, Oliver was the at that time, he was the director, and Franz Servani, Alicea oh, was wow. there, yeah. Raquel Rios Rey, yeah. uh, the muralist, uh, um, Aboy. Um, Compostela, también, because they were doing the school there, too. I, I, was, I didn't meet them. Uh, um, uh, uh, Cultor Tomas. Um, Ca eh, Batista. Uh -huh. he was Batista, there. Medina, también and, estaba ahí. And his brother was actually doing the restorations. So right, Batista. right. So uh, I, I was, I was exposed to all these wonderful artists, um, and watching them work. But uh, mainly Omar, you know, and, and and as always, Omar was more than gracious and very generous with his time, with the people, and and giving. Um, of his art uh, and the posters, so I I I gathered a, a wonderful collection via my grandfather and myself and Omar's generosity and and also um, prints. I mean, I was fortunate to have um, the La Línea Clásica and um, the. Um, yeah, they all form the mount part of the Sheldon Museum. Now, too. yes, mm -hmm. I was looking tr very hard to contain this collection. It's a very noteworthy collection, and uh, I didn't want to separate them. 
so finally at the Sheldon Museum, took the collection that it had, which was over 500 posters, wow. um, 500 plus, and then not uh, the prints and, and silk screens of Omar and other artists. Uh, at that time I was friendly with Galo Sari. Uh, Domingo Garcia was hanging out um, oh. and uh, seeing Matorel with uh, his uh, um, the group there and uh, who was the one who used to do the stars? Oh, Joaquin Mercado. Joaquin Mercado. Um, oh, Joaquin Mercado. And I, but I also Joaquin Joaquin Rey. Joaquin Reyes. Ah, Joaquin Rey. Joaquin, Joaquin Rey era de Prisma, del grupo yeah. Prisma. Oh. Um, and. Um, Isaias Mojica, who's a sculptor. Uh, so I, 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 was, I, was, I was just privy to all this. And um, I didn't really meet Dufino till later on. Um, though I, I, I did meet the Dufinito, the brother at the time. He, he would just roam around no. all over the place. <laughs> but, um, and then from there I came uh, to New York. Uh, so what do you do, you know? So I went to the Art Students League just by chance, <coughs> fell into it, and that's where it I started. Well, no, I was, uh, no, I was, uh, no, no, it was actually the same time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was at um, the Art Students League and I was taking drawing and painting, and, uh, and I, I collage. So I was with Leo Manzo did uh, uh, collage, and it was odd, uh, it was odd because I was also, in order to go to the uh, Art Students League, they, um, I became a monitor, because it paid for my, my classes, so, you know, monitor, basically, you're in charge of the class, you set up, and so it was funny, because every, every spot that I had, so you're dealing with maybe 30, 40 people, you set mm -hmm. up the, the classroom. And the students would complain to the teacher that I always had the best spot. <laughs> 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 so I said, oh, you want my spot? I'd get up and I'd move to another spot. <laughs> and then you'd have someone else complaining. Oh, well, she has that spot. I want that spot. Yeah. So I, I always had that difficulty of working, you know, <laughs> really. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it, was, <laughs> it was an odd place. But and then I was, uh, I actually was in a, I think I was in a group show uh, given by the Caribbean Center. I forgot where. And that's how I met. I don't know if you remember, but that's where I met Fernando y Marco Dimas. They were there, and I had a couple. That was of in Ana Malta's. Well, the first ah, year, Centro, sí. Hispanic festival that you said. The yeah. Centro, sí, yeah, estaba yeah. en la 108, yeah. 108 Street. Yeah. So I, I was there, <laughs> and I met Fernando and Marcos, and I didn't know who they were. And then uh, they said, oh, they liked my work. I, I and then they were mentioning they had Taller Boricua in the residency. And I said, okay, I'll go check it out. And I went, and they said, okay, you're in the residency. <laughs> and that's where I met Nestor. Yeah, we shared a studio together. <laughs> and we shared a studio at uh, Gilberto and, and Hernandez. And uh, Jay. Hey, you have Hernandez. to mention Jay because yeah. he's, you know. He's Jose Rodriguez. Uh, uh, Jose Rodriguez. Cifrido. Cifrido. Yeah. Uh, Vidal Centeno. Vidal Centeno, yeah. Uh, the, these were the characters who were there. Imani Vega. Imani mm -hmm. Vega, yeah. the character, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> so that's, that's what happened there. And then uh, jumping back and forth from the Art Students League to Taya Boricua, um, I was uh, submitted uh, my portfolio uh, to see if I can get a scholarship. and. Uh, I remember, I remember there was this other Latino artist, um, I forgot from where, but uh, <coughs> he uh, said, what are you submitting? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, I think I'm submitting a, a, a cat, you know, a book, a drawing, a sketch book, and like four paintings or something like that. So, uh, 
so what happened, I was hanging out in the hallway, because that's where you hang out, in the hallway. <laughs> and, <laughs> and everybody walks through the, the hallway or sits in the front stoop, you know, and, uh, and uh, well-known people were there at the time, actors also. And uh, I was talking to someone saying something about, oh, well, you know, this woman, uh, she there were these women who would go to the Art Students League. It was their therapy. The therapist said, you take art classes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was surrounded by a lot of women who would take art classes. <laughs> <therapy. laughs> we're going to therapy. Cycle pack. And, and, you know, this is why I had to be shifted all the time in the spots. But, uh, right, they always wanted your spot. They always wanted my spot. It was supposedly the best spot. And I remember, oh, and I used to give the, uh, the critiques. Oh, the... Uh, Manzo and uh, they were just great. They would just tear me apart, you know. <laughs> and I and I didn't understand it all, but I got it, and I was comfortable. And then like people would come up and they'd say, "Oh, are you okay?" And I said, "Yeah." I said, "Everything you said is true." I maybe not, maybe I didn't get it, but you know, it'll it'll get me sooner or later. So their critiques were very strong. The same with Omar. I mean, he, I I. The, what people would perceive as hard critiques were always the best critiques because mm -hmm. they cared mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they wanted you to always push yourself. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate. I always got the hard critiques where, you know, the, in the league, you know, you had to be a little bit more careful because they were paying these ladies were there for therapy you were paying for the, for, the, for, the, for the art students league you know that's how it, it maintained itself so, they had to keep them coming back right? had to keep them coming back yeah. and uh, so uh, but, so actually you know, between the collage and the silk screen and the you know the cutting of the screen so all of this influenced my, my technique uh, Unfortunately, the, some of the images aren't reading well, but I don't know if, uh, if you've gone to see the That's show great. in El Museo, but mm -hmm. I hope you do. And, uh, mm -hmm. You'll see the real You'll see the, the real work. Work. <laughs> You'll see the <laughs> yeah, We had a little problem and with the color on the screen. Up, but it's uh, not no, going. It's Hold this on. One. It's this one. Oh, it's this one. This one. Oh, this side. Okay. So, um, and, and these were really more or less to me, these were all ex uh, experiments, <laughs> things that just sort of occurred. And I, uh, I, I never know what I'm doing, <laughs> so which is good. You know, I try not to think when I'm when I'm working. Yeah, yeah. You have you know? to look at the work. You have to go to the show because there's this yeah. rich textual quality that's yeah, completely amazing. lost. You know, there's no way you can yeah. capture it. And this. and there's like stenciling, and there's um. I I I really started uh. I think more when I started painting with more as an abstract or colorist, because that's what I had. I, re, you know, I think, I guess probably I felt was the easiest, you know, doing abstract or color. Uh, but also just remembering the, the, the richness of color that uh, I had seen, and especially from Omar. So and then uh, and then the collage influence. I would just sit at a little table and and start doing collage. And uh, abstract collages, though everything was abstract. And as I kept on developing, I started incorporating the figure or imagery. Uh -oh. Oh, I pressed the side arrow. I no, no, that side. wasn't you. Was that uh, well, artificial you intelligence? You can go through it yourself. And, and that one had like spray paint and, and this has paper and stenciling. Uh, and then I, I do skins. This has a, a skin and has embossed paper and I would do a skin, a plastic skin of an image. So that's how, so I could get the, un, the underplay of the abstraction and the colors uh, coming through. But you'll see uh, everything is really abstract underneath and and, and this has uh, gold leaf 
They're very sensual surfaces. I mean, they're really very rich. started to incorporate, um, I'm doing now incorporating imagery of people that I know. I appropriate image or parts and then add to it. But this is a, an image of a... And using your own photography. Uh, and using my own photography. And uh, just, I blew up a um, cheap Xerox print, you know, of this. And then I, I turn it into a plastic, meaning I just put... Um, acrylic medium and then you peel the paper away and so you get a plastic skin and, and hope and I never know what's going to happen <laughs> so I'm, I'm playing on good luck and <coughs> and a lot of accidents who is that well this is no one in particular oh. but uh, it's ju it was just a play it, it's it, it's called Santos but it's not really it's not Santos the 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 ser un santo santos is a name. Oh, it's playing with the names. So. Um, so se llama santo, pero no es ningún santo. No. Also, <laughs> uh, as we have so many. <laughs> but uh, and then here was the collage. So the collage, I basically started abstract, and then I started. To, I remember I was invited to do a, a show had to be a portrait show. So I was like, oh God, a portrait show. <laughs> so I, I did my profile. And from there, this is how I started incorporating my profile. Um, which, w when I, indirectly, I, it's, it's the profile, when I think about it in a way, it's, it's I always think of my grandfather and Omar, because uh, we, we have a similar <laughs> Noses. <laughs> um, so that's your. That's your. That's your. Those are your eyes. No, those aren't my no. eyes. It's just an appropriated image. But the profile is is, is where it, it uh, is. I see as myself. Mm -hmm. So um, so this is where the figure came came in and uh, and work and playing with that. It's. Uh, <coughs> With the uh, flat and, and uh, dimension, but it, 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 you can see it is still very abstract. You know, it's torn, and the collage is great because, and and with, you work with hard edge and and torn edges, which is uh, that's what it's that's what the fun is all about, and trying to figure out which one works the best. You know, but you, you can keep going. And here is sort of I was going into my hip hop, which seems. Uh, to be uh, a very defining um, images of, for me as an artist, people relate to it. And you know, uh, as you start getting into it, you start uh, developing themes. So here is a um, uh, a dance, which I do a lot of dance, and it has to do with the urban, and it has to do with the culture, and, and what's happening in the street. But, uh, but once again, uh, I think you could see the influence of Omar. I mean, just having those, those little, like, uh, rectangular forms on the side and, and the motion. And, and if you know Omar's, I mean, here you see his hands, the hands, the way they go. And, uh, and when you saw him on the um, diving board, it's, it's like this precision. And, and you see the motion happening, and they're uh, they're not here, but they're I mean posters that I remember where he would do the um, the Pan American Games, all the athletic mm -hmm. or the dance posters, which he's well known for. So uh, all of all of this has has influenced me. Yeah, they, but they both tell him and Tufino, they both yes. allow with the strength of the silhouette of a yes. figure, because the Santero, for instance. The, He's sitting down and he creates this wonderful silhouette. Yeah. Uh -huh, with the orange. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here's another one. This is a Barrio Boogie. <laughs> and, uh, which was interesting because of the perspective. 
you know, you, you get a street person and then someone coming by and taking pictures and documenting and, and you see the motion and then you also see what that, that dancer is seeing, you know, everything is like uh, going crazy. Uh, and that's what's fun, I think, I think about, I mean, collage could be done to anyone, but here there's a lot of motion and movement in, in the collages, even if you see a profile. The way the eyes are set off, uh, you always have that look or that that movement or motion. And this is called a dark mystic. I got into um, I I was doing a lot of, of eyes, and here all of a sudden I I got a fetish for ears. For some reason. <laughs> I started doing all these ears, like not one ear, and 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 I, you know, we do things because things happen to us in our lives. So you know, it's the way we see things, and then all of a sudden it was like, it was like uh, I think I was hearing a lot of things, or maybe I didn't want to hear, or maybe I heard too much. So I think I got involved with the ears. You know what's interesting about a lot of Roca's work is that it looks monumental, and a lot of them they're they're not that big, they're small. But when you see them reproduced, you get this sense that they're like when I first saw this, I hadn't seen it, and we were working on the catalog, and I thought this thing was like I don't know, 24 by 30 at least, and it's really a a small, powerful collage that, that screams for space. And this one, uh, I think, was a favorite of uh, Daniel Veneziano, who's the director <laughs> of the museo, uh, who was gracious enough to give me the show and, and to present my work more to uh, the public. I mean, I, I was sort of known in the inner, very small inner circle, but I, I think he really opened me up to more to the community, uh, which I think was very, very important. Though Dayet also had shown my work uh, also, but you know, having it in a museum makes a big difference. Um, I think I'm gonna is there, look. There's some pieces here because I think we're running a little late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if there's something so in particular you like to show. Basically, uh, I'm 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 good. You're good. <laughs> oh, the, it was just the volando. Was just uh, it's it's just uh since we were on that, it was just a. Uh, oh, volando's a piece that we were yeah, just looking. Yeah, it, it it had um you know it had everything going for it. It had the dance, it had the falling, and. You know, Volando, is she flying? Is she falling? Is she trying to stay afloat? So a lot of these things are what's happening in my life. You know, trying to stay up, <laughs> to continue. Um, it actually reminds me of bacon. Just in terms of space. And, and, and there you see, like, the ears also. That is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the eyes and the hands. So uh, I think uh, we should go on to Nitsa because... Okay, yeah. uh, and go see the show. It's up, It's been extended to December 19th now. Oh, wow. Bring your family. Yeah. Yeah. I feel a lot like Christmas. <laughs> okay. 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 Nitsa Tufino? Well, here I am. I guess everybody knows who I am because they know the old man, right? Who are you anyway? So, anyway, uh, I'm going to put this in contest of Omar and, uh, because um, my life, uh, since I was a kid, I was around all these people. So um, there's an influence on everybody in terms of my life and them, you know. And uh, So from... When very young, when my dad started printing with Omar uh, La Plena, and I saw him doing the carving, I immediately, I think I was about five, I said, well, I want to do that. <laughs> and he cut up some little linoleum pieces, and I did some little drawings and stuff like that, and I started carving them. That's how I started doing prints at that time, because I was influenced by by those prints and what uh, Omar was doing. Uh, when I was a little kid and they both worked in La División, I used to run 
around, around the whole Ivetco place. You know, I had the whole place to myself. I could go see when they were passing the movie or when they were looking at editing, so I knew how they do the editing. Other times I used to see them when Canario was there and they were playing, doing La Plena. So all of these things influencing me and, and me a lot, you know, Manuel Hernandez printing the seal screen. And uh, uh, <clears throat> from that, you know, that's, that's a big influence. And going to the countryside uh, with Amilka when he was filming, well, I need children, okay, so come with me. <laughs> well, I need to go with him. So, you know, you become uh, an actress, you become, you know, you start doing what they're doing and all of that. So with Omar, uh, with them, even with Torres Martino and uh, Cecilia Horta, who was also a painter, they were, uh, they, were, they, they were teachers at the University of Puerto Rico. And on the weekends, on Saturdays, they used to give classes to children who wanted to come in and learn how to paint seriously or drawing or stuff like that. So when I was 10, I was integrated into that department, the fine arts department in the university. So I started painting at 10 uh, with Torres Martino and Cecilia Orta. And as time went by, then seeing Omar doing the, the scenery for Juan Bobo, and Alma was one of the big dancers, and Ana Garcia, well, I want to dance too. So I started <laughs> taking dance classes. Susan was taking classes too. Uh, with the Ballet de San Juan, and then I used to take Spanish dances also with Hilda Navarra. <laughs> Pantoma, I even got into Pantoma, seriously. And then at times I used to do this every day after school. This is not going after school program. This is heavy. You go to dance, you do exercise, <laughs> and all of that. Other times, you know, you see Cachiro Figueroa and the Figueroas. They live in La Avenida de Diego. So I want to learn how to play the piano. Yeah. So, you know, so I can't, I, I mean, all these people were very close to me. They welcomed me, they teach me, and uh, I saw them perform and all of that. So I had a very rich, uh, I, I was very, uh, by nature and because God wanted it like that, uh, I was put in there in that sense to be influenced by all of these things. But then as I get, I get it getting older, and then I come into the States also to go to school here, traveling back and forth and all of that and talking to Omar. I mean, Omar and my father, I used to, when I was a kid, they saw each other every day outside from being in La Divetco. Uh, we lived in San Jose on the border of Valencia. So Omar used to pick up my father every day. So I saw Omar every day in the morning. I wanted to learn how to drive the car. He would see me in the car. He would let me do my thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> used to take me to school. So, you know, very close. They, my mother used to cook for them Mexican food. Uh, sometimes Dorothy would make different types of food from uh, in La India, Arabe, you know, whatever, because there was nothing in Puerto Rico. So this is how they used to entertain each mm -hmm. other. And my father used to give them, make gifts for him of paintings or whatever and vice versa. I remember at times we had La Mujer de Barceloneta in the living room that was Omar's uh, print. Uh, when my father did Gojita, because Gojita also cooked for him and helped him, you know, my, she knew a lot about herbs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And whenever Susan got sick or Laura, you know, she would prepare stuff and give it to Dorothy. So they had that painting in their living room for a long, long time. He lent it to Omar for quite a while. He wanted, I want to have it in the house. So they used to do things like that, uh, lend to each other. And as time went by, me influenced by all of these things, uh, I started realizing that also at the same time I had to break away from it. I have to start, if I wanted to have a career in the arts, I needed to make a break and make a, a difference. If I would have stayed in Puerto Rico, and this is something that many times I discuss with Omar, uh, because Don Ricardo also, because uh, me being from there and being taken care of by everybody, do I really uh, find my potential or I don't find my potential? Because you're, you're being taken care of and they love you and all of that. And then also you become an engreída. 
you know what I mean? Yes. So, cuando uno se ingría, you spoiled. You get spoiled. You get spoiled. So, so as the time <coughs> went by, uh, I started deciding whether I stayed at the school of the Instituto de Cultura in the arts, or I come to the States, or I go to Mexico. And my mother stepped in, and she says, no, you're going to Mexico, to uh -huh. San Carlos. This is where you have to go. It's a total different perspective. Uh, it's not Europe or America. It's totally different. And discussing it with Omar, he says, yeah, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. So they blessed me, and I went. And at the time that I went, I went with my mother. Uh, the head of the San Carlos era Leopoldo Mendez who is one of the most renowned pre-makers. So I was in the right place with him. And then to paint also, but the best place. To me, Siqueiros, Siqueiros mm -hmm. was awesome. And being in his studio in Cuernavaca when he was doing La Marcha de la Humanidad, and being close to all these people. Outside from that, that my mother was <coughs> part of the Fridos with Frida Kahlo. <coughs> I met a lot of people <coughs> through my mother. So I separated myself from Puerto Rico in that sense. Then I'm in another set of situation, which is good. But then also, I also even met Hoffman. I don't even know who Hoffman is. He's a German sculptor. Hans, he moved in. Hans, yeah. So uh, all of these things were great, you know, good. I was able to become more independent on my own and do my own thing, travel, come back as much as possible, go to Puerto Rico and see Omar and discuss my work and things like that. So that I continue. And then uh, my father moved to New York and he was at Taller Boricua with these guys. And I, was, I happened to come in and visit at that time. And when I visited, uh, Manuel Otero asked me if I wanted to be part of the year. I said, fine. And uh, it was really great because that was also the idea of uh, the, the, the la División de la Comunidad, Taller, the community, and all of that. And it was the beginning of El Museo del Barrio. So when I'm getting my hands really into El Taller, everybody in El Taller were creating strategies. And so a lot of strategies during that period with Carmen Gallery, Friends of Puerto Rico. So El Taller tells me, you have to go to El Museo del Barrio because you are the one that knows the people in Puerto Rico. Malta became the director. Manuel went to work at El, to do the brownstone, who happened to be at El Taller and Sammy Tanco. So I got involved with El Museo and, and Adrián Garcia. Y Adrián Garcia. So what happened after that, <coughs> I moved to the Museo del Barrio. And uh, Marta had gone to Puerto Rico a couple of times, but I guess they were not paying much attention to, to her. Puerto Rico is very funny during that period because people used to go and take advantage of the artists there, take their work, and all of that. So they were very particular who approached them. But since I'm family, I was able to go over there and talk to Don Ricardo, talk to the different people at the University of Puerto Rico, people that were very close to me that I knew for many, many years. And they opened their doors to El Museo del Barrio. And they started developing all kinds of posters. Luigi gave a whole collection of, of graphics, Latin American graphics. Uh, and we were able to do that. And then I was. Uh, helping Marta, you know, we decided, okay, well, let's do a big show with, with the Metropolitan Museum. Do you think it's going to be possible to do it? I talked to Don Ricardo. Omar was very instrumental in that. And my father mm -hmm. with the poster, because he did, that's why he did yeah. the poster, because we decided that uh, my dad and him should be the ones to, to do the poster. So Omar did this one, and my father <coughs> did one of Francisco Yet, of, you know, Francisco Yet. So all of those things were very instrumental uh, from Puerto Rico to open up the doors to El Museo, and then from there, that's history. In terms of my work, uh, I continue painting, and my, paint, my, my passion has always been pre-making and painting, serious painting. And looking at the way, the way that the artists in Puerto Rico, Omar, my dad, Carlos Raquel, they were 
they pushed really the techniques and they really, really worked at it. They did one and they did another one and another one and they were never satisfied and uh, created new techniques and stuff like that. And then my passion became that I wanted to do murals and how can I do murals that were permanent and that uh, it also enhanced the community and told something about the community and that they were able to transcend. So I started competing for uh, commissions. This is something that I discussed with, with Omar so many times that I went to visit him. And uh, then I started getting the commissions and I started doing them. And then I started creating my own techniques within uh, the ceramic and linoleum printing and all of that, which a lot of people don't do that. And uh, that's how it all started. When I did the Third Street Music School, and then after I did the Third Street Music School, then I did the train station, the 103rd. Then I got the 86th Street, which I made it into a whole pile of program with education and hiring young people in order to turn their, their lives through the arts. So there's an influence there about the VETCO mm -hmm. and so, so, so the society and how you <coughs> use the arts and all of that and how, where does the money come from? Uh, the money came from, uh, from a man in 86th Street that was uh, developing a big complex. And because he was doing that complex and he wanted a Sony invariance, because I'm also uh, an urban affairs uh, graduate from Hunter College, which is very funny how I got that master's. <laughs> because I was showing, I came, some students from the department came to me because they wanted to integrate the arts in the department through muralism. And they said, well, can you come and give a talk about it and stuff like that? And I said, well, you're going to pay me? They said, no, we don't have any money. I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so they did a whole big thing in, Roosevelt, in, the Roosevelt, in the Roosevelt house. And I went there and I made a presentation. And before I knew it, I have Hans Spiegel. Oh, you're Tufino. I know Fred Wales. You got to be part of this. You got to come over here and do the something with the arts and all of that. And they gave me a scholarship. And I said, but why would I want to study urban arts? <laughs> urban affairs, you know, what is that going to give me? And so you will learn a lot. I said, you know, he said to me, I said, yeah, but what I want is for them to pay my credits for give me money to support myself so I could paint, <laughs> you know. So they gave me a whole scholarship. That's how I got it. And I got into the program here and I was there for a year with Hans Spiegel and a couple of other guys and I learned a lot and then after that I flew away from it. I did also the 86th Street and the 103rd. Mm -hmm. And then I continue, continue doing my, uh, I did the uh, Metropolitan Hospital. You could check my website, uh, Metropolitan Hospital. I did uh, La Guardia Community College. I did another big piece for City College. So I continue that, and then I, I continue at the same time doing my paintings and my prints, some drawings, and things like that, and then kept connecting with El Taller and all of those things. But uh, really, I needed to separate myself from Puerto Rico in that sense, because after a while, you know, yes, you are like a Tufino, you know, but I can stand in my own two feet, and my work is different from his. You know what I mean? He's my father, he's a great artist, but I am an artist on my own. So then in the past few years, what I've been doing now, that I've been concentrating on painting, and this is <coughs> after he passed away in 2008. I don't remember what year I did this. I think it's 2000 and 2000. When was that Campechada? I don't remember. Three years ago, two? Or yeah, two, two or three years ago. They did La Campechada, so for La Campechada, I decided to honor him with doing this Papi Leyendo. Nice. So it's a large painting of him reading. What is he reading? You know, usually his philosophy, you know, the tape of philosophy and stuff like that. So uh -huh. I did this one. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I did another painting of him, uh, which is a portrait of the Rafael Tufino way, because I always felt, but I don't know if it's there. Maybe something else. Well, this is the 86th Street. Mm -hmm. um, when I did the 86th Street, that I told you that this guy had a big complex, 
uh, on the west side by 86th Street, which he wanted a sonium variance. And because you want a sonium variance, uh, you could go to the community planning board and uh, uh, ask that you want to build much higher. Uh, they'll give it to you, but you have to give some amount of money to the community, okay? So uh, we, the community made a deal, and we got $224,000 uh, through the community, but whatever money the developer gives to the community has to go to a site that is near the, the improvement. That money has to be put into the improvement near the area. So it always either go for hospital, transportation. For that area, it went for transportation. So. The problems that the community had there was uh, uh, dropout. St uh, students dropping out of, out of school and not getting their high school diploma. Uh, what can we do about it? So they invited me to one of their, with the president of the board, MTA and stuff like that. So I said they were afraid that they were gonna get the money, the money was gonna get spent and there was not going to be a product. In other words, this is something where in a community when you do a project, you want everybody to win. Everybody has to win. You gotta have an attitude of everybody winning. So I said to them, you know, we could do really something fantastic. Uh, because in the beginning they said, okay, well, why don't we do it with artists? You know, I said, no, 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 no artists. Let's work with the students, and they're going to get paid by an hour, but we're mm -hmm. going to do a contract, and we're going to put a program where they, they have uh, teachers in the morning, and they are going to take the classes to get their high school diploma, and then after that, we're going to make sure that they, if, if they can, they could go to college, and they're going to learn all the techniques, and they're going to do this, and this is going to be their artwork there. And it has to be about the community. How do you study a community? through photography. I even invited Pedro like Pietri. There's I invited another shot Pedro of the Pietri. Oh, there, with the there, there, so I got them all there. <coughs> uh, and this, a lot of them were, these were students that had a lot of problems. I have some students where they have a, a program where they go on the weekends to Rikers Island. They're free during the week, and on the weekend they're to Rikers oh. Island. Mm. And it was terrible because by the time they got back, they were upside down. Then by the time <laughs> they leave Friday, Thursday, it's okay, and then they go back mm -hmm. to the situation. <laughs> so I had about 20 of them. And then uh, <laughs> very, it, 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 it was, you know, but it was, we did, I did it for two years. Oh. Wow. Two That's years. Uh -huh. what, what, what year? Two years. I, I don't remember. It was 1984, 1984, 19. 85, oh, okay, so the way that I did it was that I told them, I got a contract and I said, well, I want all the money. I decide how we're gonna spend the money, what, uh, what you know, what, how I'm gonna use it, how I'm gonna pay. I'm, I, hire, I hire a psychologist for counseling mm -hmm. at the same time. It's a like lot of them got like their high school. school. Yeah. Like they had the exactly, so what I'm saying is that I did, <laughs> Uh, I adapted it to the situation in the urban setting because this is one of the biggest problems we have right now is the youth and that they're bored and all of that. And now a lot of them also, you know, they, they were out in the street selling drugs. They used to come with packs of money. So I used to pay them $4 an hour, $5 an hour, okay? What could they do at the end of the week in two weeks with a check? It was like nothing, you know what I mean? But what kept them coming? They like doing the artwork. They like what was being discussed in the studio. Uh, so all of those things. And then I would invite other people to come in, and that really changed their lives. Many of them, I think there was an article in the New York Times. The editor of the New York Times, about, this is about, t t we're in the 20 years, 20 years. Yes. He happened to go to the station uh, downstairs, and he looked around and he said, what is this? He started looking around, what is this? Who did that? Where are these people? So he got a, one of his journalists to do the research and he started looking for everybody and he got in contact with me. And we started to get in contact with some of them. You know, they have some have moved to Virginia, out to Florida, uh -huh. and stuff like that. So this I was a project. Let's see. 
there was this this was a project oh, this, yet you this see is okay. this is part of in other words <coughs> the community was from 110 to 80 uh, from 59th street to 110 from riverside drive to west End. so it encompassed all of that so what what would we do with the student students we will go out into the street in the different times springtime summer whatever take pictures walk around and see how the community was in the west side and the diversity of it. Uh, we did the same thing with Pedro Pietri. I hired Pedro to be one of the, to write, so they could write about the community. There's also a poem in the station, which is done in silk screen, mm -hmm. but it's glazed. Uh, so they learned, this they learned how to do this. This is another one. So what's the elderly taking the bus? Uh, restaurants. Uh, so they develop them. these images. They develop so they develop. Yeah, you go with them. You pick the images and you study the community. Also, another thing we did: we go to different organizations. I taught them so that they could be engaged within the community. Right. So you go to different organizations, find out what they're about. They could talk about it. I had a panel. I had a panel which Agnes got from the Museum of Modern Art uh, was part of it so that uh, she could see and talk to them too about the design and stuff like that so that they would have more engagement into the whole technique. Yeah, become a and service, yeah. Exactly, so I did this because I thought that this was important to teach the system that not only with the amount of money that we had, uh, the developer can win, and he was very happy. He even threw a party uh, for the unveiling. Uh, for the students and the people that participated uh, because he felt that his money was not thrown away and that he got what he wanted, the community got something, the student got their mm -hmm. high school diplomas and million. some of them, I think two or three of them one, uh, went to the School of Visual Arts <coughs> and continued and their careers. Uh, that everybody can win. So Kylie, who was the president of MTA, and he was so happy with the outcome and that this could be used as a model. But then nobody else has done anything about it or decided, like, you know, why don't we keep doing more of these projects, you know. Well, if you're an artist, you will have to dedicate two years to something like this. I don't know if too many people that are artists were willing to do that, okay? But I decided to do it because I thought it was important for society and for this to be a statement that it should be there. And it was successful, it was great, you know, and it's still there. And I'm mm -hmm. very happy that Dinkins loved it very much because he was very worried that uh, the money was gonna f go away and uh, nothing was gonna happen, that he told Kylie, uh, Kylie spoke to him and said, you gotta give her the President's Award for doing the project, which I think they gave to me, I don't even remember. But <laughs> these are the things that, that that, that happens when you put your effort on your situation and there's money and you could hire people and you could gear uh, programs to go in that direction. In this one, I was uh, invited to Central Connecticut State University to be an artist in residence uh, to teach muralism. When I got there, I spoke to the the department, the art department. I got together with all the, the the, the teachers, no, the professors and all of that. And I said to them, okay, I'm willing to come here and be a, an artist in residence and all of that, but to do a mural, what I want to do is that the department has to have a program for students that are going into their masters or in education and all of that, <coughs> that is geared to doing public art and to dealing this type of high quality. Because in Mexico, the uh, San Carlos has a program of muralism. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I said, okay, so I, that's what I'm going to do. And I say, they said they didn't know how to go. They, they didn't know how to go about it, whatever. Well, I got there, and because I have the skill and whatever, I befriended the mayor of the town. I became very <laughs> good friends with the president <laughs> of the college and all of that. So everything started up here. I got a huge studio. Um, I even got scholarships for the students to come in and take the courses with me. So that, and I got a hospital, which is called the Hospital for Special Care, which is a very 
a special hospital because these are people that are terminal or they're born uh, with abnormalities and they have to live in the hospital and stuff like that. And it's made with all the, you know, it's a beautiful place, but there was no artwork. They had problems with the artwork because it affects the patients and the people and the people that walk in. It was very, you know, very crazy. So I said, okay, I got together with the president and with some people on the board and some doctors. And I said, okay, why don't I bring my students in and we talk about it? and they didn't know where the money was going to come and I said listen don't worry about it we'll put the time we have the equipment at the college we have all of this all you have to do is pay for the materials so we did we did a research in terms of talking to the doctors talking to that this is a student i made them do all of this which is really great because this is how you when you're an artist you know i mean you view the space you check out you know what type of materials it should be made in and all of that but you really do study people and you study the architecture not only and and the design and the colors and all of that you got to see how people come in how people live who are the ones that are there what type of problems they have don't have any problem because you want the work to transcend so we came up with doing this 100 feet mural in tiles Glaze. This is all done in English tiles, uh, white tiles, and the uh, design is supposed to be. Uh, it's a holistic piece. It's uh, nature, so it's the four seasons. The four seasons is goes from winter to spring to summer to autumn, which is a circle, and that circle is what nature gives you, which is like from the changing, and also includes us in there, but all you see is just nature. And that mural is there, it was hung, as a matter of fact, after we did it, uh, we needed money to hang, in it, hang it up, and, it come, and I, I got in touch with a company that said, okay, we will put it up for you, we'll do everything if, we, if you let us use the advertising. And I said, no problem. You could do the advertising, whatever, and say that you did it here, and with, you know, and, and that's how we did it. Yeah. And it took two years. On the floor, the tile, and then you yeah. put it No, the in the wall. So it showed show them the other, the it's other. The thing is that you gotta go in the website. See, this is, yeah. you see, that's the back. That's the back. The the, the opposite the side of that wall is an aquatic swimming pool, for very specialized for people that they, they use, you know, so that they could do yeah. exercises. And also, I think this is in the, uh, New Britain, Connecticut. So a lot of people from the community can also use the pool, you know, for it, but it's very specified what hours and this and that. I just wanna, because uh, Omar also during the, the Pan Am games, he also right. did murals. Uh, yeah, he did he ceramics, like ceramic that Ceramic murals oh. and, uh, they're just beautiful. I don't know if they still exist, the one. I don't know. They, they were going to, I think at one point, you know, they were going to take them now because it was him, Mirna Baez, and Torres Martino. They did sort of like a triptych. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So these are things that I discuss also with him, you know, because many times I've been out here for so many years, even though I keep going back to Puerto Rico and uh, family sometimes. When my father was more, uh, alive, I used to go more often, two or three times in one month I used to be there and stuff like that. But these are the things that I did with my work, outside from the other work, that my paintings and all that, which is more personal. Uh, so if you're an artist, you know, you have to make like a balance of doing those things. But uh, working for the community and stuff like that is, really fantastic. These are prints. This is one that I did for a portfolio for Sam Coronado, who I put, passed I put away. I these two together because yeah. this is Mexico and then you have yeah. one de los Taino, okay. Yeah, this one is, was the, the studies for Neoborin King, which is another thing. When I did the drawings for the station on 103rd Street uh, that you see every day over there, I think they got to do something with the station, even though the murals yeah. are in pretty good shape. And they're already. You fix one side of the station, <coughs> it looks pretty good. 
Yeah, because yeah. they have one with all the tubes going up and yeah, that. I say. No, but they opened it up already, right? They opened one side. Yeah. They opened one side, so I hope that they fix the <coughs> other side. So when I, when I got this, is you know, these are mainly competitions. You know, this competition is is not it's like five thousand people. Okay, that you gotta um, compete yeah. with. So you, you you make it because of the excellence of the work and the competition that you can adhere to a timeline that you can work with an architect, you know, and Castro Blanco was the architect there and stuff like that. These are more personal pieces. This is a, like a biography of myself and my life and I call it hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, the closet, nice. going out of the closet. So I keep adding, this is a series that I'm doing and I keep adding to it, you know, and I do sewing. I put prints, I do drawings, and catches, and stuff like that. I can tell, yeah. uh, this is one period during the 60s, or not during the 70s, when my daughter was uh, <coughs> born in 73, that I started doing um, puzzles out of wood in the jigsaw, you know what I mean? And then I will make stories like her, the moon, the sun, you know, la madama, the Imaguas, you know, and uh, this is one of the puzzles that I did for Rachel. <coughs> so I tend to do things for my children. Well, I think yeah. uh, we're running a little on time. So We've overextended it. ourselves a bit. Oh. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't, I, don't I think that's the last one. Uh, no, that's yeah, the last you one. have to go in the website to see more yeah. stuff. But uh, so you I do, do it. Oh, the Nick Satufino. That com. That com. That com. <laughs> 